So cancer is going to increase more and more. And I think uh, even if cardiac surgery goes out of fashion, onco surgery is going to keep us in business. So I think it's all very important that we continue to we know more about cancer and we you know we learn about some of the problems that cancer patients face. And of course, this is largely based on the fact that I've been working in Tata Memorial Hospital for almost my entire life, okay, after post-graduation. So there are many, many problems with cancer surgeries, right? You've, you've got elderly patients who've got comorbidities, uh, and they have major procedures, blood loss, fluid shifts, etc., etc. But I'll focus just on a few aspects. What is the effects of chemotherapy? And nowadays, with the newer agents, you know, the targeted therapy and the immunotherapy and so on, and I think every week there's some two new drugs coming up which become increasingly difficult to pronounce and uh, write. So, but you know, they seem to be coming up and they are being used more and more. And patients who previously had unresectable tumors become operable and become treatable because of these uh, drugs. And then we have to deal with the effects of those drugs if there are any. Right? And I'll talk about head and neck because that's a major part of the work that we do and it's also exciting for anesthesiologists. And lastly, I'll talk on the effects of anesthesia on cancer recurrence and metastasis. Okay. So this is there in any postgraduate textbook that you know cancer has many, many effects. And of course, there are nutritional problems. Patients may have weight loss, but some patients have neuromuscular abnormalities. Some patients have endocrine problems, okay, especially adrenal insufficiency, hypercalcemia. Patients with pelvic tumors, especially ovarian tumors and uh, cervical cancer of the uterine cervix can have ureteral obstruction. Uh, and of course, in the chest, they can have pericardial effusion, spinal cords and brain wet. So we leave those because those patients are unlikely to get operated. But some patients with, especially with cancer of the lung, right, can have a neo, uh, what we call as a paraneoplastic syndrome, which results in a syndrome either myasthenia gravis itself with a thymoma or with CA lung they can have a myasthenic syndrome also called the Eaton Lambert syndrome and the bottom line is you know they will have increased sensitivity to muscle relaxants and aminoglycoside antibiotics and they may get uh, this thing it's not very common uh, but it's something we need to keep in mind many of them produce hormones which are ectopic hormones and the ones which may affect us are those which cause hyponatremia for for example, ADH secretion from lung cancer and pancreatic tumors and so on. But again, we won't go into this because it's 9 o'clock at night. We won't go into great detail. Anemia is extremely common. It's common even without cancer and it's even more common with cancer. And I think it's important to correct anemia because you know, we all talk about restricted transfusion and don't transfuse. At the same time, anemia is also harmful. And patients who have anemia also have more complications if the anemia is not corrected. Fortunately, now... Uh, with the new intravenous iron preparations, it is much easier to treat anemia. And in our pre-op uh, clinics, if we identify a patient who is anemic, then we actually give them an intravenous iron on that day. And hopefully, and you can almost always wait for two weeks for even a cancer surgery. And so by the time the patients come up for surgery, they get worked up, etc., there is a slight increase in iron level. So we are able to, so I think we must focus on trying to treat anemia preferably without blood transfusion and with intravenous iron has made our life much simpler these days. Okay, they, Some patients have thrombocytopenia or coagulopathies but that's a minor thing but anemia is something which we need to really worry about. So this is something, okay, so this is a case who is a breast cancer survivor. She was treated more than two years ago. She's now scheduled for some other surgery but in for her treatment of breast cancer she had received what they call a CF, that's cyclophos. Okay, and she also had received radiation to the left breast, the on the left side of the breast. Okay, she seems to be otherwise okay. Now the problem here is that she's received adriamycin two years ago, and uh, adriamycin is a drug which receive which causes left ventricular dysfunction. It causes a chronic cardiomyopathy, especially when the dose exceeds about 400 milligram per square, 450 milligram per square meter. And there are many other drugs which cause. Uh, left ventricular dysfunction adriamycin or the anthracyclines are the probably the most common and the ones which have the maximum incidence of ventricular dysfunction there are others especially the, what we call as uh, paclitaxel or docetaxel they also cause but adriamycin the unique feature about adriamycin is uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment uh, but and there is this other drug called trastuzumab or herceptin 
that is a monoclonal antibody and is used in what they call as triple negative breast cancers who have ER negative, PR negative and uh, who are positive for uh, this uh, uh, Herceptin receptor, okay, HER2 positive. So Herceptin and Adriamycin are the two important causes of left ventricular dysfunction if they've received these agents. The difference between the two is that Adriamycin has a cumulative toxicity and it is progressive even if you've stopped the Adriamycin. Okay, so even if the adriamycin is given two years ago, the longer you carry on, the damage is progressive. So in fact, just because the adriamycin stopped and just because it's two years ago doesn't mean the patient is not at risk. In fact, this patient is going to remain at risk and that risk may actually increase progressively throughout her life. You know, so you need to be a little careful when adriamycin has been given. Trastuzumab or what is called as Herceptin is if you stop the Herceptin, the ventricular dysfunction recovers. So that is reversible. Whereas adriamycin is not reversible and progressive. So you just need to keep that in mind. And you need to check the echo. And you can do a MUGA, but uh, checking the ejection fraction or fractional short shortening, something you can do. And you can look at the diastolic dysfunctions of maybe there. So you just need to keep that in mind. So like I said, that this is dose dependent and it is progressive. Okay, with adriamycin. There are some agents, especially 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, uh, which causes myocardial ischemia. And these patients, you may, you get symptoms exactly identical to a myocardial infarction. They'll present with chest pain. You'll find the patient postoperatively having chest pain and sweating, and you do an echo, there'll be a reduction in the ejection fraction. But again, after that will reverse, go away in some time. And you invariably you might land up getting an angio or something done, but you need to keep some of these uh, issues in mind okay and there are many of these new drugs which are coming you know bevacizumab i think bevacizumab had a brief uh, moment of glory during covid when some people were at random trying bevacizumab here and there it's a very dangerous drug it causes pulmonary embolism it causes thrombosis it causes intestinal uh, perforation and obstruction and it also causes myocardial dysfunction and myocardial ischemia okay okay so there are other drugs which cause uh, problems, but you know you don't have to worry too much about them. But keep these two or three drugs in mind. Now, if you had radiation to the left side of the chest, especially those who had in the past, I mean, say maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, where the radiotherapy techniques were not so well developed, they often had damage to the lung as well as to the heart on the left side. And radiation causes an end arteritis. So the coronary arteries would actually become stenosed at some point in time, and you could get myocardial ischemia. So, and you could, so that's something, you, but the modern radiotherapy machines and the modern techniques, they sort of avoid that damage to the heart and the lungs, but you could have had patients who've been cured and breast cancers survive for very long. I mean, you know, 10, 20 years is not unusual with breast cancer. So how many have heard of uh, Lance Armstrong? He was the Tour de France uh, cyclist, multiple uh, this thing before it, he got caught in a doping scandal and that kind of thing. And our own Yuvraj Singh, okay, they both had a testicular tumor which was treated with, uh, so they are usually affects young men. They have a testicular tumor which may be metastatic, often metastasized to the lungs or to the mediastinum. And they get uh, chemotherapy which is, works brilliantly, like it's, it's curative almost, it, it is curative. They get bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin. So they call it BEP, bleomycin, etoposide, platinum. Now, bleomycin is a culprit agent because it causes lung fibrosis. And in the long term, it causes lung fibrosis. So many often, they've now started omitting bleomycin from the recent protocols. So they give EP rather than BEP, but many patients would have received BEP. So, so if you receive bleomycin, you need to look out for lung damage. Okay, And you can do it, of course, by standard... Uh, uh, clinical testing and pulmonary function tests, but maybe a six minute walk test and a pulmonary function test which includes a diffusing capacity is warranted if the patients have received bleomycin. Now the story doesn't end there. In the past there was, uh, so the incidence may be almost 40%. There are other drugs like Atra which is mainly for leukemia, so we won't worry, but bleomycin is something you need to worry about because it causes two problems. One, it can cause a chronic fibrosis, but it can also cause an acute pulmonary edema. And in the past, it was believed that acute pulmonary edema or acute uh, capillary leak in patients who receive bleomycin is triggered by two things. One is excessive fluids, which is not surprising, but also by high FiO2. 
and in the past there were recommendations to limit the FiO2 down to the bare minimum which maintains oxygen saturation. Now there has been lots of controversy because you know these are all multifactorial things, many things happening in these patients. They used to undergo the retroperitoneal load dissection, they used to have a lot of fluid losses and lots of fluid would be given, blood would be given. So you know there were multifactorial things for getting uh, uh, lung pulmonary edema and lung fibrosis. But at the end of the day I think it is just better to keep it simple don't give excessive fluids keep your fluids to the minimum and also keep your FiO2 to the minimum so that you know and you don't need a hundred percent saturation a 95 96 percent saturation is good enough and many of them can be easily maintained on 21 or 25 percent oxygen so if they've got bleomycin just a bit a little about protecting the lungs so although there is no evidence or firm evidence to suggest a relationship between fluids and FiO2 and uh, progressive lung fibrosis and ARDS we suggest that you have a judicious monitored fluid therapy and the lowest FiO2 required to maintain oxygenation. Okay. Radiotherapy to the lung also causes problems. So if you had lung radiotherapy or even radiotherapy to the breast, like I mentioned about the old, apart from the heart on the left side, it can also damage the lung on the right side. And chemotherapy agents and radiotherapy agents are additive. So if they've had uh, chemotherapy which damages the lung and they've had radiotherapy they get additional sort of uh, a double hit if you want to call it so pulmonary fibrosis is something which you can get okay now if you add radiation to the head and neck lots of problems can occur so you can ha start with you know mucositis and you can have temporal mandibular joint fibrosis and uh, you can have uh, teeth which get damaged, they get very brittle, the mandible become, undergoes uh, osteonecrosis and the teeth become extremely loose, the tongue can get uh, become enlarged, can get fibrosis and all of this, so these changes will take place in the tongue and the floor of the mouth, when you put your laryngoscope blade in, this tissue will become rigid and you are not able to lift up from the valicula when you do a direct laryngoscopy. So that can make your laryngoscopy extremely difficult because of fibrosis and edema in the suprahyoid region and you know this edema in the lower airway can persist for months after you radiotherapy has been given. So you can't say oh this is a two or radiotherapy, okay. it's quite likely you might have swollen uh, you know cords and that sort of thing. You just have to be a little careful in all these cases and one simple test you can do you know if you just feel the floor of the mouth here in the neck just below the chin and you should normally get a nice supple feeling over here like when you push your tissues here but if you find that they are firm and rigid you should anticipate trouble with your direct laryngoscopy so that's one sort of tip which you can keep with radiation okay so the problem is you know why are we talking so much about chemotherapy agents because let's say 30 years ago when I joined TMH many of these surgeries were per primum surgical location you know, the breast patient came you would do a surgery on the breast ovarian cancer came you would knock out the ovary you had a retroperitoneal node you would surgically resect the nodes today 80 percent maybe 70 percent of patients get what we call as neoadjuvant or pre-op chemotherapy so all about 70 percent of patients with breast with uh, ovarian cancer testicular cancer would have received chemotherapy pre-op and then come to you for surgery so they will have some of these effects of these uh, chemotherapy agents so for example this lady who's come with ovarian cancer has finished her cisplatin chemotherapy 5 cisplatinum so the platinum agents they are okay but patients who receive platinum are prone to develop renal failure because uh, cisplatinum is nephrotoxic okay and uh, there are many sort of these things but you should do a renal function test in everyone who received cisplatin and take care to protect the kidneys in other words hydrate well avoid hypotension the usual things but treat these patients as if they are at high risk of acute kidney injury some patients with advanced disease will also present with obstructive uropathy okay, and they may need the drainage of the uh, this thing of the kidney of the urine by percutaneous nephrostomy or something before they come up for surgery there are other agents but i think the main one that you need to look at is are the platinum derivatives that is cisplatinum carboplatinum is less nephrotoxic but is not that is not non-nephrotoxic and they lose potassium and they lose magnesium so very often we don't me measure magnesium but if these patients have hypokalemia you take it for granted that they've got hypomagnesemia and supplement both potassium and magnesium otherwise you land up with lots of arrhythmias and problems in the perioperative period okay so this is a patient which is not uncommon at all severe trismus right and 
इन यंगर डेज यू नो व्यूज देखता है रिलैक्सिंग देख के दिखता है मुंह खुलता है फिर थोड़ा दांत डाल के एक दो दांत तोड़ के लैरिंगोस्कोपी करके विल पुट द ट्यूब सो द रियल क्वेश्चन इज वी आस्क वी आर रियली ट्राइंग टू गेट एट इज विल दिस माउथ ओपन वेन यू गिव एनेस्थीजिया एंड अ मसल रिलैक्सेंट एंड ऑफकोर्स यू कैन ऑलवेज गिव द मसल एक्सेंट एंड एन सी वॉट हैपन्स बट यू कैन ऑल्सो ट्राई एंड प्रोडिक्ट बिफोर हैंड एंड दैट इज वेयर लुकिंग एट द सिटी स्कैन and the uh, clinical history of the patient will help you so many of our patients are pan and gutka gutka chewers right so and they also apply tobacco to the cheek or they apply that uh, paste to the cheek and they keep it and that causes a pre malignant condition called submucous fibrosis so if you see this submucous fibrosis over here this thing this white sort of thing over here this will not open because this is fibrosis this trismus is going to remain fixed this is not going to open so if he's got submucous fibrosis it's not going to open more so that is the going to be the extent of his mouth opening even after you give a relaxant okay secondly you should look at the ct scan especially those who got cancer of the cheek okay so this is the infratemporal fossa and this is the pterygoid muscle and this is tumor the t which has invaded the infratemporal fossa and infiltrated it into the pterygoid muscle so if that has happened this trismus is not going to open further okay because your muscle has been infiltrated and your muscle may also be fibrosed okay and of course if they got radiation and they got tm joint fibrosis and muscle fibrosis that is also not going to open so just have a so don't always think that chalega thoda itna mouth opening relax in dega to itna khul jayega and we'll be able to put a blade in and do that it may not happen and submucous fibrosis and temporomandibular joint involvement will suggest that it is not going to open up now this is a patient whose mouth is wide open right you can see the mouth opening is very wide but he's got a cancer of the tongue and he's got a cancer which is involving the entire left side of his uh tongue left border of the tongue and going all the way back towards the base of the tongue now this is where you put your laryngoscope blade in and if you got a large tumor like this your blade may not go in and if the tumor is going all the way behind you may not be able to slide your blade in to be able to do a laryngoscopy so this patient even though his mouth opening looks good is not going to be very easy to intubate and also uh if the tumor is going if there is ankyloglossia it means the tumor has inf infiltrated the muscles of of the tongue and again you will not be able to you may not be able to take the tongue to one side when you do a direct laryngoscopy even a video laryngoscopy may be slightly difficult over there so ankyloglossia is a big red flag lesions along the right border and going up to the base of the tongue and valicula are also very big red flags so these patients should be considered uh, preferably for awake intubation awake fiber optic intubation okay so if you see tumors like this like this and this is a tumor which is involving the entire valicula and coming up and valicula is where your blade rests so if there's a big tumor in the valicula and base tongue your blade is not going to go in and you are going to have great difficulty in visualizing the larynx so these are all red flags even though mouth opening is often normal but base tongue right lateral border and uh, uh, ankyloglossia are very important red flags and you should consider an awake intubation another is you know patients who had previous surgery and after a period of recurrence free they come back with a recurrence then they can have a lot of problem now this patient you can imagine what all problem your mask is not going to fit you are not going to be able to ventilate this patient well and you know you may not be able to insert your blade this patient's probably been radiated and the tissues may be hard so again these sort of problems are going to be here so be very careful and respect the airway of these patients very much don't try and be a rambo mai kuch bhi kar sakta hai mai kahi bhi tube dal sakta hai just doesn't work in this setting if there's one thing that cancer end of the head neck teaches you it's humility right so better to step back and play, be do a safe job rather than try and show off and land up in trouble and i remember i was actually not this patient but there was another such patient they come with what they call an andy gump deformity you know they remove the mandible so this thing is gone and there's a flap sitting there and uh, he was for a repeat surgery so i was doing a fiber optic for him you know i was i had planned a fiber optic i'd given topical and he was thin like this and he was probably a little dehydrated he was malnourished he had lost a lot of weight and i gave him 1 mg of midazolam with that 1 mg of midazolam his tongue fell back and there was no mandible to retract i put in an airway oral nasal nothing would lift the tongue of the tissues and he started desaturating in front of me 
okay, and I could not ventilate him, I could not give him oxygen, complete airway obstruction with one milligram of midazolam and all these anatomical sort of abnormalities. And he was the first patient whom I did a cricothyrotomy. <laughs> okay, I actually put in a needle and gave jet ventilation and he survived. Okay, then we did a tracheostomy. But so you have to be very, very careful. So, I don't know over here, but many of my colleagues and others are friends of mine. For them, fentanyl midazolam is standard sedation for fiber optic intubation for any procedure. Kuch bhi gaya pehle fentanyl midazolam. Then they will start thinking what to do. Okay. These are the patients where this just approach is just not working. And actually, ever since that day, I try and give minimum sedation or no sedation to my fiber optics who are genuinely difficult. Sometimes you do fiber optic to teacher juniors, that's okay, you can give them sedation. But a genuinely difficult fiber optic intubation, the total trismus or something like this, I don't give any sedation. That has changed with Dexmed. But till Dexmedidine was available, I would not give any sedation. Even that half milligram of midazolam or titrated doses, I said nothing. You know it's titrated when you get airway obstruction. Till then it is not titrated, right? So you, so, you just, so that's something that you be very, very careful about some of these patients. The big surgery, you know, right? the big fat gabada as we call it is there and they've put all sorts of flaps and this thing. So now how do you extubate these patients or do you extubate these patients, right? So the big flap here, there's a big flat lower down, no laryngoscope blade is going to go in near the larynx for a flap which is there like this. So. In the past, uh, and in many other places, the safest thing to do is to do a tracheostomy. The safest thing to do is a tracheostomy. And once the patient has recovered fully and you know, after a few days, the swallowing is better, etc., etc., you can close the tracheostomy and remove the tracheostomy. But in our place, because we've got a good backup, what we do is in, uh, if the resection has, so okay, if the resection has crossed the midline, if there's a very large bulky flap, they get a tracheostomy for post op But if it's not across the midline, the flap is not very big, the flap is lateral on the cheek, you know, but and not occupying a lot of the base tongue or the floor mouth and all. We keep the tube in the, we don't extubate the patient after reversal, we keep the tube overnight. Next morning, we check whether the bleeding is okay, the patient is awake, okay. And then in the recovery room, we extubate the patient. If we feel there's going to be a slight problem, then we put extubate over the airway exchange catheter. So airway exchange catheter is long, long sort of catheter. We put it in, so that is in the trachea, and then we extubate over a tube changer. If the patient maintains the airway after an hour, we take out the tube changer and send the patient after another hour of observation. If the patient does not maintain an airway with the tube changer in place, then we can nicely reintubate because we've got a guide over which we can put the endotracheal tube. Occasionally, you've extubated, everything seems to be okay and suddenly the patient has airway obstruction. That is a desperate emergency and keep your fingers crossed. Believe in whatever God you want to believe in and try and secure the airway, okay? Because if there's a big flap like this, you may not be able to do a proper laryngoscopy. If the patient is already desaturating, fiber optic may take time. There may be secretions and blood over there. Fiber optic may be difficult. Sometimes you might just have to hopefully maintain some oxygenation with a bag and mask and then go ahead and do a tracheostomy, okay? Or a cricothyrotomy if that's an emergency. So there is no recipe for this, but you have to be really keep your wits about you when something like this happen. Okay. So this is an x-ray of a patient who is scheduled for a large cervical lymph node biopsy. And the surgeon is asking you for GA. Okay. So this patient has a mediastinal mass over here. And he also has a neck mass. Okay. This is an adult x-ray, but this sort of thing comes up often in children. And in children, you cannot do this uh, neck or peripheral biopsies under local. So you invariably land up giving GA. Now the problem with a mediastinal mass is that a mediastinal mass can precipitate complete airway obstruction depending on its location and depending on what uh, you do with the child. So this is a mediastinum which is the place, you know, the space between the two mediastina. Uh, the heart occupies the middle mediastinum. In front of the heart, so between the heart and the sternum is the anterior mediastinum. And behind the heart and the spine is the posterior mediastinum. 
right? And a line at T4 at the sternal angle divides it into a superior and a inferior mediastinum. So roughly here is this is the carina would be about T4. So all these structures are in the superior and anterior and middle mediastinum, right? This is a carina, there's a trachea, there's a carina, there's a pulmonary arteries over here. So if you've got a tumor, it could compress all these structures and they could compress the trachea and the bronchi. As far as we are concerned, that is probably something which is very, very important. Okay. Now, the funny thing about these things is, you know, when we are breathing spontaneously, during inspiration, the volume of the chest increases, right? The chest expands. So the volume inside increases. So the mass doesn't cause much obstruction. But if you give anesthesia and you paralyze the patient, then the volume of the chest decreases. And when you give positive pressure ventilation, there's even more pressure in the chest and that increases the compression of the tumor on the trachea and bronchi. And even though the patient is otherwise maintaining his airway while breathing spontaneously, when you give anesthesia, they're very likely to decompensate and obstruct. And then it becomes very difficult to handle these patients because if, if there is a big tumor and a solid tumor and it compresses the trachea, you may not be able to push a tube beyond the obstruction. Right? When the obstruction is right below, it's almost up to the carina or maybe in including the bronchi. So then you can be in a very, very serious soup. Okay. Uh, so what we often say is patients often need a CT scan and children will need a anesthesia for CT scan for a biopsy of the medial mass or they might need a biopsy of some other peripheral lymph nodes. So if the tumor remains and secondly, especially if they're doing a biopsy of the tumor itself, after biopsy, there might be a bleed into the tumor. So the, again, it might expand and cause, cause a problem. The symptoms can worsen. Uh, ideal situation would you do under local anesthesia, do a biopsy of a peripheral lymph node. Or maybe even a, radi a good radiologist will be able to do a, if the tumor is little in front, they can do it from the chest wall, they can do a good true cut biopsy under local anesthesia or maybe ketamine. Problem is so idea is that you should either avoid anesthesia or keep the patient breathing spontaneously. So whether it's with inhaled agents or with ketamine IV, if you can do a short diagnostic procedure, it's okay. Chemotherapy works for many of these tumors if they are lymphomas, but oncologists are absolutely reluctant to give empirical chemotherapy, even if the child has got severe obstruction. They'll just first do a biopsy and then we'll give chemotherapy. They want the tissue first. Report may come after five days, but they want that tissue bit taken and then they will keep so they will not give emperor. So sometimes your hands are forced and you have to sort of, you know, uh, get into trouble because of these sort of situations. So this is a huge mediastinal tumor. Can you see now? This has compressed the superior vena cava. See the carina? It's not two round holes. It's completely flat. Severe obstruction. So when you have masses like this, just remember that even though they may not be obstructed initially, they can, you can precipitate obstruction by induction of anesthesia, which worse when you give IPPV. So if you have to give anesthesia, try and maintain spontaneous breathing. But of course, you're doing a thoracotomy, that is also going to be difficult. Okay. Uh, you cannot, uh, so you, how will you rescue this patient? If you have severe obstruction, because the obstruction is in the chest, it's at the level of carina. Tracheostomy is not going to work, endotracheal intubation is not going to work. The life saving instrument for this patient is a rigid bronchoscope. And the life saver for this patient is a rigid, rigid bronchoscopist. So don't take up such cases like this unless you have a bronchoscope, rigid bronchoscope with light source which is working and attached and everything is working. And a bronchoscope is someone who knows how to do a rigid bronchoscopy, who can do a quick fast rigid bronchoscopy, right? Not someone who's never done a rigid bronchoscopy in his life. Just because you're a thoracic resident, don't call him. But so get so, so that is your life. So always have that in your history. The odd patient, if you're really unlucky or the patient unlucky will also have compression of the pulmonary arteries. And they have sudden hemodynamic collapse or they may have a pericardial effusion. So you should do an echo in all these sort of patients. So when you see a patient like this with a mediastinal mass, you have to risk stratify. So the safe ones, are adult patients with no tracheal compression and no postural symptoms. Then you can sort of breathe easy. Remember that adult tracheas, the rings are solid. A child's trachea, the rings are not solid. So in a child, even if the child is asymptomatic, it's not necessarily safe. It's not necessarily safe, okay? 
So this is definitely safe. Then these are definitely unsafe, right? That is severe symptoms. Patients who are already in strider or a child who is in strider, a child with 50% recal compression, right? That may not be very symptomatic, but child. So 50% is bad. Compression on the CT scan. The CT scan is your biggest sort of diagnostic tool. So read the CT along with your surgeon and the radiologist and try and figure out all these sort of things, okay? Postal symptoms. I mean, when they lie down, they get breathless. When they sit up, they get less breathless. That's unsafe. So these are unsafe. And all others are intermediate, intermediate risk, okay? So low risk, you can probably go ahead with what you normally do. High risk, don't give general anesthesia. Okay, and intermediate risk, keep your fingers crossed and keep everything standby, including rigid bronchoscope. Okay, okay. Some patients say, okay, we'll keep cardiopulmonary bypass standby. And I think this is one of the myths that needs to be busted. There is nothing like a standby bypass or a standby ECMO. When the patient has collapsed, has airway obstruction, is hypoxic and about to have a cardiac arrest or has a cardiac arrest, Tend to do eCPR is going to be very difficult and dangerous, right? To then start cannulating the vessels and then to prime the circuit and then to go on ECMO or bypass is taking too long and the patient will be finished by then. So if you have a patient who's high risk or who's got severe symptoms and you're worried, it is better to at least cannulate the vessels first and keep the bypass machine primed and ready to go. And then take your chances with that. Okay, so don't wait for standby bypass and so cannulation should occur before you induce anesthesia. Under local anesthesia, you should cannulate the femoral vessels and go ahead for bypass. Uh, go, be prepared for ECMO or something like that. Okay, and last thing is, you know, we always worry about cancer and anesthesia or the effects of all these cancer and cancer agents and anesthesia, but a lot of interest nowadays is in does the anesthetic technique itself contribute to cancer recurrence and metastasis? And if it does, then either we've been killing patients or if we can do something to prevent cancer recurrence and medicine, then we can become the next oncologists, right? So, and you know, the theory around this is that the perioperative period, right, is a time when there is surgical stress and the release of stress hormones and many things happen so like when the tumor surgeons handle the tumor there is physical shedding of tumor cell right the tumors gets detached from and the cells go out into the circulation as a response to surgery as a normal response to surgery or even any wound there's an increase in growth factors right because that promotes healing but there's an increase in growth factors, the drop in level of angiotensin and all surgery all stress is mildly immunosuppressive if you see that all stress is mildly immunosuppressive and there is an increase in proangiogenic factors. So this is an environment which is actually pro-tumor, pro-tumor because growth factors are high, angiogenic factors are high, anti-angiostatinogenic factors are low okay, and surgeons are releasing tumor into the circulation because of manipulation. If at this time, in this sort of period, the immunity drops, then these cancer cells which normally are taken care of by the immune system what we call as immune surveillance so those cells go in the immune system packs them up and finishes them off so that they don't spread or metastasis don't occur but if immune surveillance is reduced either because of stress response or because of the drugs that we use or some surgeons may use if any of those things reduce the immune surveillance then there is a propensity for cancer cells to survive migrate cause recurrence and metastasis. This is a theory, right? And when you start doing these studies in labs, okay, when they looked at these things in the labs, if you put cancer cells with halothane, if you put cancer cells with ketamine, you will find that the cancer cells grow. You put them in animals, you find that the tumors grow. So lab evidence seemed to suggest that, my God, you know, Halothane, because those studies were done with halothane, sevoflurin, they tend to grow in tissue culture. So then people started thinking, by God, what, what are we doing with anesthesia and cancer? Then there was this study, which was a very, very, very provocative study. These were patients who were undergoing surgery for breast cancer. There was one anesthetist and one surgeon pair, one combination. Okay, The anesthetist always gave paravertebral block. Okay. And the other anesthetists always give general anesthesia. So some were excellent anesthetists, 
know, who did some fellowship in Ganga, like some of y'all, and someone like me who don't know how to give a paravertebral block. So we always gave GA. And the survival of the patient who received paravertebral block was much better than those who received GA. Okay? But of course, this was a retrospective study. And there are many confounders that can come in. Maybe that surgeon was a better surgeon. Maybe the surgeon who was doing under GA was not such a good surgeon. Maybe the the post-op treatment or something was better by this fellow, whatever it may be. But it's a retrospective study, so a lot of confounders come in. You can't swear and say, but it seems to suggest that, my God, there might, there's something here, right? There are lots of studies happened like this, okay? They did some studies in prostate cancer. Again, it seemed to be epidural plus general was better than general anesthesia alone, okay? So again, suggesting that uh, something about general was bad or something about regional was protective, yeah? Then people found out that opioids that you use are probably very bad for cancer cells. Okay, so they increase production of uh, VEGF, vascular, vascular endothelial growth factor. So, the, so it increases growth, causes more angiogenesis, suppresses immune system, NK cell activity, natural killer cell activity is reduced by opioids. So that is, so opioids may be bad. At the same time, they found pain is bad. So uncontrolled pain is bad. Opioids are bad. So, how do you find the balance between controlling pain with opioids and giving opioid and all? So, again, but these are all lab experiments, okay, lab experiments. So, then they looked at all drugs like this and all the ones which are not in green have been shown in laboratory settings to have a detrimental effect on cancer cells. And the ones in green have a good effect on cancer cells. So, propofol is good. Tramadol seems to be better. And COX-2 inhibitors, you know, celecoxib and roficoxib, they are actually used in the treatment of some cancers. So, they seem to be good. So, so there was a big sort of uh, duvida, you know, I mean, what are we doing? We are treating cancer and we are giving general anesthesia, are we doing something? And how could regional anesthesia be better? Well, regional anesthesia definitely reduces the stress response, isn't it? So, when you give epidural or spinal, the stress response is virtually gone. Right? So, that maybe that is important. When you give spinal analgesia or epidural, then you don't give that much opioid because the pain is taken care of by their regional technique. So maybe uh, you give less opioids, you give less inhaled agents, you know, so maybe that may be thing. We don't know, right? But there is, but you have to understand that we look at retrospective and prospective studies which say that one technique seems to be better. It's an association. It's not a causation. You cannot say that regional anesthesia was better or that General anesthesia caused cancer, more cancer. It's an association. So, patients with uh, who drink coffee have a higher incidence of myocardial infarction than those who do not drink coffee. That means coffee causes myocardial infarction. No, that's an association. Coffee could be drunk more by people who are more stressed and maybe that's why they are having a myocardial infarction. So, the, you cannot... Uh, establish causation, it's an association and that's not necessarily cause. I, you understood the difference between cause and being associated with it. I mean, I am associated with five people who go and commit a robbery. That does not mean I have committed a robbery. They committed a robbery and they came and we had tea together. So I'm associated with robbers, but doesn't mean I have committed the robbery. So it's something like that. And then you had all these reviews which came out that, you know, some said, yes, there's an effect. So, all confusion, total confusion. So, then there was another very well-cited study, right? And this was, again, like I said, a retrospective. So, again, lots of confounders. And this compared all patients who received surgery under TIVA versus all patients who received volatile agents. So, TIVA versus Sevoflurin. And they found that those who got TIVA had a better outcome than those who received inhaled. So then the theory became that inhaled is bad and TIVA means TIVA is invariably propofol, propofol and remifentanil in the UK. So that is good and TIVA is bad. So and then there were studies looking, some found yes, TIVA is better, some found no, TIVA is no, no better. It's as good as this thing. So a lot of confusion. So the only type of study which can actually establish causation or who, which can give you a definitive answer to a randomized control trial, where you randomly allocate patients either to GA or to regional 
and then see whether the difference right so random allocation prospectively conducted randomized controlled trial and one such trial was performed in 2000 which was reported in 2018 okay and there were almost 2000 patients women undergoing breast cancer surgery half randomized to paravertebral block and half randomized to general anesthesia and fortunately and very much to my relief there was no difference in outcome <laughs> okay there was there was also no difference in other outcomes like presence of chronic pain or persistent pain which is a bit of a surprise because we all believe that if you give regional anesthesia if nothing at all you are able to prevent chronic pain or persistent pain but even that was not seen okay so except for a little more incidence of nausea and vomiting in the ga group there was no effect on cancer right so as of now the only good randomized controlled trial evidence which is there suggests that there is no difference between inhalation anesthesia or and paravertebral block that regional anesthesia for breast cancer surgery so till i retire i think i'll be okay okay so okay there were other small studies again which suggested there was no difference in the this thing there are other trials which are going on as we speak and maybe in the next the good thing about these trials is we're looking at breast cancer or other cancers you have to wait for one two five years before you can know whether the difference on survival or not so we have to wait for some time first for these studies to get finished and then for the wait for that follow-up period before you can say that survival is there or not so in the, maybe in the next three to five years we'll get some more answers but as of now what should we do the, like i said there's a lot of laboratory data but uh, we are not rats and we are not rabbits and we are not cells in a test tube we are humans and there are many things in the human system which cannot be duplicated in the lab so when the human body reacts to either cancer or to uh, stress or to something there are always mechanisms counter mechanism regulatory counter regulatory mechanism which cannot be fully understood and as of now the randomized trial assumes that all these things are equally balanced on all sides and therefore the only difference is between the two interventions that we are making so that seems to suggest as of now there is no difference but certainly if regional anesthesia is appropriate for your case go ahead and use regional anesthesia but don't say i want to do head neck surgery on the total complete spinal up to the uh see up to the this thing because say that does if you want to do uh combined epidural with ga that also seems to be fine because you reduce opioids you reduce uh, inhaled agents all the sort of things so you can do that but don't give very high spinal or don't give so much propofol that then you need to support the circulation you know, then because that itself causes other problems right so tiva seems to be good so if you can safely and nicely give tiva go ahead and give tiva okay you should give opioids to patients who have pain don't deny them saying that dr deveta in his lecture put up one slide where opioids cause cancer so i saw nahi is nothing there nothing like that okay currently i don't think there is enough data to support any dramatic change in the way we give anesthesia so whatever you are comfortable with go and do but i would suggest try and get a better hang of regional anesthesia it will help not only in cancer but in many other cases so that's a different matter altogether yeah so thank you very much for listening